Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program, Learn to Speak English Confidently, Fluently, and Effortlessly. Join my VIP program today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Live today, live on Facebook today. And today we are talking about Chapter 3. Chapter 3 of our new book, Dumbing Us Down. Dumbing Us Down is the book. The writer, the author, is John Taylor Gatto. Today, Chapter 3 of Dumbing Us Down. I'll just say hello, everyone, joining live now. Hi, everyone who's saying hello. Lots of familiar names. Hello, Effortless English family. Hope you are doing well today. Ty from Georgia Caucasus. Hey, nice. Okay, so today we're going to do chapter three. Now, chapter three of this book is actually quite different than chapters one and two. In chapters one and two, we got the big ideas at the beginning of the book. Really, in chapters one and in chapters two, John Taylor Gatto gave us his big main ideas about school and education. In chapter 3, he really just tells us a story. He, just, he tells his personal story. He tells us about his childhood in the beginning, growing up as a child. And then he tells us how he became a teacher. So let's, let's get started, shall we? Just, just saying hello, hello, hello to everybody. You know what we'll do? We'll go through the chapter, then I'll come back. I'll talk a little bit and answer your questions and comments. I think maybe a little shorter today because this chapter is quite simple. There were a lot of ideas in the first two chapters. This chapter, actually, I think, is actually a much more simple chapter because he's mostly just telling his personal story. Let's go. Chapter three. Let's begin. Okay. Chapter three. The green mon... Uh, how do I pronounce this word? Man mono monongal gahela. <laughs> All right. Obviously, you, you could probably tell that's not a normal English word. That's just some name. Monongal I don't know what language that comes from. That name, but uh, it's the name of a river where John Taylor Gatto, the author, it's the name of a river in his hometown where he grew up. I can't pronounce that. Ma, ma, monoga, monogahela. Anyway. The chapter begins with John Taylor Gatto telling the story of his childhood. So he talks about that he lived in a, a town 40 miles southwest of Pittsburgh. That's kind of the northeast part of the United States. And this river went through his town. And this river was very important to him. He said, this river was my laboratory. My laboratory. You know, like in science, they have a laboratory where they do experiments and learn. He said the river for him growing up as a kid, that was his laboratory. Laboratory. He said, I learned to watch closely and Draw conclusions there. Draw conclusions means uh, make decisions, you know, decide about meaning. Let me close this door real quick. So basically what he's saying, he used to go out to this river every day and he would, uh, he, he studied everything at this river. He would play in the river. He, he said he would chase the dragonflies or these flying bugs. He would look at the bugs on the ground and study the bugs on the ground. And then he also would um, watch the boats because these boats, these big steamboats, 
would go up and down the river and he would watch the boats and he would watch the men working on the boats. And he says he learned a lot, a lot about life as when he was little, just on this river, looking at all these things happening at the river. And he says that when he was a child, the river boats were serious magic. They were serious magic. They represented, these boats represented the world of men, the world of grown men. So he was a child. But he could see all these, you know, grown men working on these boats. Because these were not boats for fun. These were boats for, um, you know, trade. These were working boats. So he, he felt these boats were magical, you know, because it was like, oh, all the, the men working. This is, that's the world of men, right? Not, he's still a child. So he's really curious about it. Now, another thing that was important to him near the river, there were, was a train track. And that's the other thing. He said he and his friends, the other children, would also always uh, watch the trains and they would play around at the trains. And he says that very often when the, a train would stop in his town, the kids would all run up to look at the train and then the the guys, the men who worked on the train, the bra he's called, he says the brake man, the engineer, the engineer is like the driver of the train. <clears throat> Excuse me. They would um, come out and they would tell stories to the children. They would let the children run around and look at the train. They would let them get on the train and look at it. And they would tell them stories about trains and travel. He says at that time in America, he said, if men, grown men, if they had time, if they had a break from working, for example, they had some free time, they would show boys how to grow up. This is his main point. His main point is that all adults, not just his parents, not just teachers, but that all adults, all men in this case, they would take time to teach children. Right? If they had a little free time, they would teach them something, teach something about their job, teach them something about life, tell them a story that everybody felt like it was their responsibility or their job or their, you know, enjoyment to uh, help the boys grow up to be men and to teach them about the world of adults. And he kind of uh, finally, as he's telling this story and talking about how he learned so much by just, you know, watching the people, the workers on the boat and talking to them. And sometimes they would actually go out and they would get to look on the boat sometimes. And he said that much of his childhood, most of his childhood education, <coughs> excuse me, he said, was taught by everyone in the town. He says, I learned, he says, I learned to be a teacher myself. Because everyone in my town taught me, right? It was not just this one job at school, but that everybody, all the adults in the town, would make an effort to teach and help children. He says, I also learned to take responsibility, right? I, I, I was given responsibility at a young age. I was not just treated like a, like a small baby all the time. They let me do some work. They let me have some responsibility. And he said, I also learned to be proactive, right? Not to be lazy, not to depend on everyone else. He says, I learned to find adventures that I made myself from everyday stuff around me, the river and the people who lived alongside it. So he said he would create, he would find these adventures, right? He would find this learning. He would find this enjoyment. He would find this challenge and adventure just from his everyday life, right? The town, the river, the people in his town. That's where he learned mostly about life. Then uh, he tells a second story in this chapter. The second story, he says uh, he was an adult. So this is the story of how he became a teacher. Why did he become a teacher? He used to be an advertising writer. So he was a 
kind of a young adult, and he got a job writing advertisements for, for television, for example. And he said he made a lot of money. He was making a lot of money. He was very successful. He was having a great career, making a lot of money writing advertisements. But he said that, you know, something about it just did not feel meaningful to him. Like it felt empty. Something felt empty, like something missing from that job. He, like it, did, it had no meaning. He, he didn't feel like he was helping anybody. So he finally decided to leave this job and to become a teacher. And he, so he went to his boss and he quit the job and they all, everybody at the job said, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're stupid, teachers don't make any money and uh, you're very successful and teaching is a bad job to have, don't do it. But he, he, he decided to do it anyway. So first he became a substitute teacher. So he's not the full-time teacher. He would just, when, when the full-time teacher was absent, he would come in. And he tells a story. It sounds like some of my teaching stories, honestly, when I, in, when I first started as a teacher. Basically, he tells these disaster stories. He tells the stories about how terrible the schools were, how the, everything was terrible. The bureaucracy, the bosses were just, you know, stupid. They had a lot of stupid rules. Like he tells one story. He was uh, in a typing class. He was supposed to teach a typing class. But then the, the principal told him, the boss told him, you cannot let the children type. They cannot use the typewriters. And he's like, why, why not? Why not? I don't understand. And he says, because you're a substitute teacher. You don't have a certificate. You don't have the official certificate to teach typing. Therefore, you cannot teach typing, which is crazy, right? It's so stupid. But, you know, rule, th these bureaucracies, these schools, they're, they're full of all of these kind of crazy rules for the teachers and the students. And so he went into the class, and then it's a typing class. And, of course, all the kids want to start typing, but then he can't let them type and so then the whole class starts going crazy it's in a really bad neighborhood one of the students picks up a chair tries to throw it at him it's basically he's just like this job is terrible so he was very unhappy he also he said he realized that the school system uh, did not help the substitute teachers being a substitute teacher is difficult right you come into a class they don't know you you're only there for a couple of days. But he said the, the school system, the, the, the bosses, the principals, they did not help the substitute teachers at all. They, they didn't care. That's also very true. So he, was, he, he basically hated it. <laughs> he hated teaching, and he realized the whole system was horrible and kind of pointless and useless and just terrible. This was in New York City at the time when he was doing this. But he says one thing, one student made him decide to stay. Because of one experience, he did not quit. Basically, he was teaching reading, and most of the kids in his class could not read well. It was the kind of the, the, bad, read, the, the, the bad reading class, the class for bad readers. But he had this one girl named Milagro. And Milagro was a very, very good reader. Very advanced. But she was in kind of the, the bad reader's class. And so she came to him. She said, you know, Mr. Gatto, I want to go to the advanced class because my reading is much better and this class is boring and I don't like it. I want to go to the advanced class. And... So then he kind of tested her. He said, okay, he gave her something advanced. He said, read this. And she read it very well. She understood it. So he said, uh, okay, okay, you're, you're obviously very good. Okay, no problem. I'll talk to the principal and we'll try to get you into a, a higher class. So this seems simple, right? But of course, it's the bureaucracy, the school system. They don't care about the students individually. So when he, he was very shocked, he went to the principal and he mentioned, he said, this student's a good, good reader. We need to put her in the more advanced class. 
The, the principal, instead of, instead of agreeing, the principal acted angry. The principal was actually angry with him because he was going to cause extra work for her. And he's, basically the principal said, oh, no, no, that girl's lying. She's pretending to be a good reader, but really she's not a good reader. And he said, well, that's, that's strange. How can you pretend to be a good reader? And, but the principal's like, no, no, she's just pretending. But Don Taylor Gatto, he kept pushing, pushing, pushing. He said, okay, just test her, test her. Give her a test, and then if she's good, put her in a more advanced class. So finally, the principal agreed, and uh, the girl, Milagro, she took her test, the reading test, and she got a perfect score. And, of course, Milagro, the little girl, was very happy. Mr. Gatto was very happy, but the principal, he says, the principal was not happy. Isn't that interesting? The girl did very well, but... The principal didn't care. She wasn't happy. The principal was more angry still because uh, Mr. Gatto, she felt like Mr. Gatto was challenging her power as the principal, right? This is bureaucracy. This is what happens. But, you know, the good news is the little girl did go to the better class. And uh, then she wrote him a, a card. She made a little nice card to thank Mr. Gatto. And the card said, a teacher like you cannot be found. And he signed it, she signed it, her name, Milagro. And he says, John Taylor Gatto says, that's why he decided not to quit. He felt like he, this small little thing actually helped. Like he, it was meaningful. He felt like, oh, he actually helped that one little girl. He helped that one student uh, a little bit, you know, get into a better class so she maybe have a better future. And he felt like, you know, and she was thankful and because of that, he decided to stay. He didn't quit. He did not go back to become an advertising writer. And, uh, and then at the end, he says he found out many years later that this woman, uh, he found out that this little girl, rather, this little girl, Milagro, she grew up and she became a teacher when she was an adult. And that's the end of the chapter. It's a very simple chapter, actually. So you can see there's not actually a lot in this chapter. It's very simple. It's just a little bit about his childhood and then this story, this kind of very short story about uh, this this girl, Milagro. I, I'll just give you my... So I, I don't have a lot to say about this. My, my quick point about it, though, I think the main point for me in this chapter is the idea of real-world education where he talks about how in his childhood, he felt most of his learning for life was not in the school. He never even talks about the school. Right? He doesn't talk about his own school experience at all. He, no stories about being in a classroom. He's, he feels like all his learning about life, how to live and you know about the world as a child, it, it all happened outside, right? on the river, watching the adults work, the men telling stories to him, going to the railroad, right? All the other, all the adults in the town. That he learned it from life, real life, and especially from the real life world of adults in his town. That's where he learned. That was his true education, he said. Not the school system. The school's not where you learn about life. That's where you learn about life. And... I would call this real world education. Okay. This is real world education. And, and I agree with him hundred percent about that, that school is just such a weird, strange thing. It's a strange system. It's not, we know, right. That this is not a, a new, I mean, not an old system. It's a new system. This idea of like a factory for kids, a prison for children. Let's put the children in all the same age together and then make them go every year, you know, together as, and, lock them in this room and that it's a very strange system it's a factory mentality but it's not the way that real education and real learning happens and when he's talking about real world education it comes from you know the adults in the child's life the parents are of course the most important but all the adults in the child's life and there are, you know, different ways to do this. The old way, what, what is actually the traditional way of human education, it's not the school system. What, it's the master-apprentice 
it's system where in a young age children used to learn from their parents the basics of like reading and writing and basic skills if they were farmers they learn how to be farmers whatever they learn from dad and mom about you know how to be an adult and then maybe other adults in their uh, town and their family and then if they wanted specialized education and they wanted to specialize in something uh, maybe that would be something like building or maybe something more like a, a university, more academic. Well, then they would uh, find a master and the master would teach them. It was kind of an apprentice. They would work under another adult, right? They would work in that environment. And they would learn by doing. It was all, it was mostly learning by doing, learning by watching and learning by doing much more, not just memorizing things from a book. So I think that's one of the main points that he's making. And that's really all. It's a, like I said, it's kind of a short chapter this time. That's all my thoughts on it. Let's just go now then to your comments and questions. I'm going to open my window up because it's getting hot. All right. Going to your live comments now. Lots of people saying hi. All right, I'm just reading through the comments. Just get, let me catch up. In the beginning here, everyone just kind of says, ho. Oh. Okay, AJ Smith has helped me a lot. Very good. Hi from Myanmar. Lots of people saying hi from different countries. Hello, hello, hello. Italia. Ah, here's Vanya again. Let's check in on Vanya. It's got a long comment. Vanya, if you, if you remember, Vanya. Decided to take a gap year and travel instead of going to school immediately. Okay, I'm going to read this comment from Vanya. Let me put it on the screen for those of you watching on video. Ooh, it's a big one. I have to cover my face with it. Okay, AJ. Hi, AJ. This is from Vanya. I want to share you a recent update from my gap year. I took a little break from traveling because I felt really tired. Mm, yeah, I understand. Now I'm just focused on reading. I love science, so I'm learning a lot about the human race, the universe, etc. I find science quite fascinating. Good. I think it's great that I can change my activities during a gap year. Yeah, right? Isn't that cool? He just follows what he's interested in. There's not somebody forcing him, oh, you must study this and you must come here at this time. Just Right now he's interested in science, so he's going to read a lot about science. I think it's great that I can change my activities during a gap year. I have a lot of freedom. I just study whatever I want to study. And it's the exact opposite of what happens in university. Let me tell you a story about my experience in university. I went to a German university. I was eager to make sure that the university is bullshit. I pretended to be a student at the university. Oh, I see. Okay, I gotcha. So he went to a German university, not paying. He's not in the, he's not in the university. He just wanted to see what is it like. He wants to compare it to what he's doing now independently. So he joined a class, kind of pretending. I pretended to be a student of that university. I said I was from Poland and I need to improve my English. So I went to an English class and I sat in a chair. That was such a dreadful and boring time. <laughs> I just wrote some grammar formulas and listened to the teacher talk. But at the same time, it was a great experience that convinced me that I should take more than one gap year. Excellent. I don't want to spend four years doing this crap. Crap means nonsense, basically. So right now I'm focused on reading. Later, I will be focusing on other important stuff like volunteering and promoting effortless English. Well, thank you. Both things the same, actually. Yes. <laughs> thank you. That's nice. <laughs> So, excellent, Vanya. Wow. See, we're getting a field report. This is, this just, this connects directly to what we were just talking about with uh, real world education. So, instead of going into uh, university and, uh, and then he's being, for, being forced to sign up for required classes and take a bunch of tests, uh, Vanya is just uh, taking a gap year and reading anything. Anything that he's interested in right now, science, the universe, you know, whatever. He's just reading and reading and reading and reading about things of interest to him. I guarantee he's learning more about those topics than 
the people in school because he's motivated, he's curious, and he's doing it himself. He's following his own curiosity. I mean, and think about how important this is. If he went to a university, maybe his first year, maybe they would not let him uh, take classes for all those subjects. Maybe, let's say uh, he wants to learn a lot about astronomy, the stars, planets and the stars. Well, independently, he can do that. He just goes and gets books and starts reading uh, lots and lots and lots of books about astronomy and the stars and all of that. But in a university, they'll say, oh, no, no, you, you can't do astronomy yet because we have the, the first year you have to take, first you must take this English class and you also must take this required uh, basic math class. And you, right, they would have required classes. If lucky, maybe, maybe they would let him take one basic astronomy class, but probably they would say, no, before astronomy, you must take this physics class. And they wouldn't let him just go crazy and focus on astronomy. But as an independent learner, that's exactly what he's doing. And then, you know, of course, quite a funny story about English. I mean, Vanya's advanced. We can tell by the writing uh, that, that he gives us every week that he's quite advanced with English. He's, uh, you know, reading, but I, I don't, he didn't say which language. I'm guessing he's reading, uh, doing some reading in English. So why, why, would, why would he want to sit in the class and just diagram, you know, grammar formulas? Oh, it's ridiculous. What a waste of time when he can just be reading books and books and books and books and books and books in English and listening to audios and anything he wants to do. Ah, oh, it's just so much more powerful. The real world education, independent education, so much more powerful. And by the way, when he finally goes, if he decides, okay, if he finally decides that he knows what he wants to do, you know, a certain kind of job or profession. And if he, if he decides that, oh, I, I do need this university degree, when he goes back, he will be much more prepared, much more advanced than the other students who just go from high school. He already, already, he's an independent learner. All right, let's keep going. Uh, how do I get that document, sir? I guess you're talking about the book, uh, dumbing us down. How do you get the book? I recommend get the ebook. Uh, try Kobo, Kobo.com, K O B O, K O B O. Kobo.com, they have, in fact, I know they have it because I just looked on Kobo yesterday and they have Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. That's an easy way. Buy it on Kobo. They have a they have an app for reading ebooks. Okay, let's see. I am going uh, from uh, Deiki says I'm going to be an English teacher. I will follow your instructions, of course. Thank you for everything. All right. Well, good luck to you. Good luck to you. <laughs> so Carl was kind of a funny comment. Uh, AJ, I spent many years helping in, uh, helping students, but none gave me even a bar of chocolate. <laughs> I never quit, but it's a nice thing to be rewarded. The job is hard. Yeah, well, yeah. That's because you're teaching in schools, I'm guessing, and the students probably don't want to be there. You know, this is the truth. It was the same same thing when I was a teacher in school. Uh, you know, this the, uh, I couldn't teach completely freely how I wanted to. And then the students, they were forced to be there. You have to realize this is a very important part about school. It's one of the most negative things about school. This is a basic part of life. It's a basic part of being a human being. People don't like to be forced Okay, when you force someone to do something, you threaten them. You say, you must do this or I will punish you. I will do something bad to you. When you do that, people are not happy. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. And when you especially force them to be stuck in a room, 
right? The school for many, many hours, six hours or more a day. And when they feel that the time in that school is mostly wasted, it's a lot of nonsense, it's a lot of unhappy time, it's a lot of busy work that's not helpful, it's not connected to the real world, they feel like oh, this is kind of this is boring, it's useless. They're not happy. They don't appreciate it, even if sometimes the teacher's good. And, of course, some of the information is useful, like learning to read is useful. But um, they don't appreciate it because they don't understand. They don't understand why it's useful. Nobody, the, the schools don't care. The schools don't treat them like individual people. So they feel it. They can feel it. They feel that it's a prison, and nobody likes prison. Okay, This is very different than a parent teaching. The parent can explain, look, you need to learn to write, read and write. It's important f for these reasons. And then we're working together. It's mom and dad. They love you. It's very, very different. But when you're just in a school with teachers, you know, don't be surprised by this, I guess. is the. I, I didn't love my teachers either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they weren't necessarily bad people, but I, di I just didn't like being there. I was in, felt like I was in prison. Uh, the worst thing about school system is you have to wake up at a very early morning every day. Well, that's one of the bad things. <laughs> For me, I never liked it. I, I'm more of a nighttime person myself, so I, I, I didn't. I did not like getting up so early to go to school. Some people don't care about it, but. And Sukar's got a follow-up question, and it's, it's kind of nice. School's coming uh, back to start here after a long holiday. How can I make students more interested again to start, start school more actively? See, this is, a good, this is a good phrase to think about. How can I make students interested? Make has a little bit of the idea of forcing them to do it or tricking them. The truth is you can't. This, this, is, this is why schools don't work. You can't. You cannot force someone to be enthusiastic. You cannot force someone to be curious. You cannot force someone to be interested. You cannot force someone to be motivated. Can't do it. You can force them to sit in a class. You can force them to do work, but you can't force them to like it. That's why schools don't work very well. Because they're trying to force the students to do these things. And I understand as a teacher, Sukha, I'm not, I'm not blaming you because I understand as a teacher you have pressure. You're under a lot of pressure. And of course, you want the students to be motivated. You want them to enjoy learning. I know, I, I did too. And I would always try to think of how can I motivate the students better? And I would, I would do a lot of things and it was very challenging, very tough. But I finally realized that, well, finally, there's nothing I can do. I mean, I can help the ones who are already interested. If they want to learn, I can help them. If they don't want to learn, nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. They must have that. And now humans and children naturally have this desire to learn and the curiosity. Unfortunately, the schools destroy it. So once it's destroyed, once they don't care, once they're bored, once they decide they hate, school or they hate this topic there's nothing you can do about it honestly uh, really the best choice would be let them leave i that's what i did i couldn't i didn't teach in public schools i did not teach in government schools but once i got when i was in certain like kind of pr more private schools and language schools if someone didn't want to be there my attitude is i don't want you i don't want you in my class if you don't want to be here don't come Right? I, I, I do not believe in forcing them to go, especially if they're older. So my attitude was, okay, you don't want to learn English? Just leave. I'm not going to force you to learn English. You don't have to learn English. It's your choice. But if you want to learn, you got to work. You got to be here. I think we can treat these, uh, especially older kids, we can give them more choices. But instead of trying to force them to do everything, let them follow more of their own curiosity and then that will the curiosity will come back the motivation will come back but it's hard yeah you know, the school systems destroy it 
Very tough. It's, it's the whole system's the problem. Nasser says, school systems don't like substitute teachers. They don't care about your ex expertise, right? Your skill. That's for sure. They only care about the piece of paper, which is a degree. Try to force people to put their kids in schools. Yeah, they don't care. You know, for, for most schools, a substitute teacher is just a babysitter. They're just a babysitter. Like the, the regular teacher doesn't come. They just want their, They just have the substitute teacher there to try to control the kids. It's a terrible job. Being a substitute teacher is a horrible job. Really horrible. <laughs> I, I would never do it. Okay. Hasina again. Hi, Hasina. Hasina says, I've learned so much from books, so much more from books than those years of school. When I started reading books, my life changed completely. Yes, yes, yes. The way I thought about education changed. I began to think about my goals. Now I'm learning English independently every day without some teacher telling me to, right? Exactly right. Another perfect example. I, I was the same way. All the most important things in my life, I just learned independently by reading books and sometimes by, you know, directly from somebody. But, but a lot from books, 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 just reading books, exactly what Vanya's doing. Do you have to sit in a class and have to go through all the little curriculum and the tests and all the grades and stuff? That's, that just is so, so much wasted time. Just read, 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 read. Oh, that was nice. Taha says, uh, something else that proves my point. The most and best person I've learned English from is you, AJ. So those years studying at school were failures. Ah, oh, well, thank you. That's very nice. But yeah, right. So I'm, this is why it's different for me now. Because I, I'm your coach, right? So I create lessons. I do podcasts. I do shows. I've got my VIP program. But I'm not forcing you to do any of that, of course, right? You're independent learners. You're the boss. You're the boss, not me. You l use the courses or you don't. If you, if you become a VIP member, I send you the lessons every month. But you, you do the work. You decide. You're the boss. You decide your schedule. You decide, you know, I will listen one hour a day, or I will listen two hours a day, or I will listen six hours a day. You decide. And you decide, maybe, oh, I'm also going to read some books. You're the boss. You're the boss. It's, see, it's totally different, right? It's completely different when you are the boss of your learning. It's completely different. Okay, here's another comment. Ezra, I already did your suggestion about four months ago. I focused on listening and reading and listening to your live videos. Finally, today, I can make a conversation with a Polish woman. Nice. I can understand what she was talking about, but I have a little difficulty to answer back. But I think your method works for me. Thank you, AJ. Well, just keep going, Ezra. You're doing great. Four months and you're having a nice success. Keep going. You just continue doing what you're doing and you will have more and more and more and more success. So, Ezra, that's a great story. Thank you. Now, sir, with another nice question. How can we encourage our children to become active and curious, to learn from everyone, not just schools? You know, you don't... Young children... Uh, they already have this. You don't, there's, you don't have to do anything, really. Um, they have. They're curious. Kids are curious. If you're around kids, just be around kids. They're curious. They're nonstop curious, right? I think, was it last week? I was talking about a podcast, just my nieces and nephews and other little kids I'm around. They follow me everywhere, and they ask me questions constantly. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What's that? What's that? Oh, why are you doing that? What's this? What are you eating? Uh, they, they're just like... they. 
nonstop. They right. <laughs> they make you crazy sometimes as an adult, actually, because they will ask you so many questions all the time. So what do you need to do to encourage it? Just answer the questions. Um, the other thing you can do is use use libraries. Libraries are great. Anytime when you when your child is curious about anything, 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 doesn't matter, any topic, anything, small, big, doesn't matter. If they're curious about something, go to the library with them and find some books about that topic. And then you can read them together. You can find some picture books. You can find, if they're more difficult, you read to them and explain. You just, that's all you do. It's really so easy. It's so simple. You're just, what they, they're naturally curious. So whenever they're curious about something, just start learning about it. You can, of course, you've got a computer too, so you can get online. You can do searches about, watch videos about the topic. Just any topic. I don't know. Think of any topic in, at all. I don't know. Um, I'm just going to pick a random topic. Let's say, ah, okay, here we go. This, this is an SD card. It's a memory card. Right? There's nothing, right? Just use it for cameras. Use these cards for memory. So let's imagine you've got this memory card on the table and your child comes over. What's this? And you say, oh, well, it's a memory card. Oh, well, what does it do? There's your opportunity. Time to learn about memory cards. You can then, well, I, well, let's, how does it work? Let's find out. You could, you could get online. You start searching about SD cards and memory cards and start learning about, you know, how do they work? Because right? I don't even know exactly how they work, but they're like little hard disks in there, right? And you could just, it could, maybe it's just a one hour time period of learning where you just learn a little bit about what's a memory card, how does it work? That's a tiny example, but you'll have these examples all day, every day. And then maybe the next day, you know, maybe, uh, one more thing, you know, maybe you never know. You just have to follow the curiosity. Maybe your child will become very interested in this. Like they really, sometimes, sometimes for some topics, your child will become super curious. So they will want to know more and more and more. And then they want to know about the memory card. Then they want to know about cameras. Then they want to know about computers. And this can go on and on and on for many, many days and weeks and months. Or sometimes it's, it's the opposite. Sometimes it's maybe just five minutes. They, what's that? It's a memory card. Huh? And you just explain. You give them a short explanation. Maybe you could look online a little bit. And they go, oh, okay. And then never again. They don't care. <laughs> they're, they're not interested so much. That's also fine. Okay? Because every child will have different things that they become super curious about. And it changes with time. You know, right? It changes with their age. So right now, you know, my nephew is a good example. He used to be interested in mushrooms, and then he became interested in trees and acorns, and then he became interested in bugs, and now he's interested in crayfish, like little crabs. He catches them, and he studies them, and he's got them in his apartment. Um, so you just just follow their curiosity. That's all you do. That's all you have to do. It's really it's so easy. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, let's see. Um, from Molson says, Hi, AJ. I love your book club shows. Well, that's good. Thank you. You teach us how to take the red pill. Yeah, there's our matrix metaphor. To know how deep the rabbit hole goes. You taught us to manage our money. You taught us about government and media. You teach us about schools in your courses and audiobooks and shows. Also, you're teaching us English. I don't find a word to thank you. Thank you, Professor Hogue. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Yeah, but you're right. I do. I like to teach more than just English. Just English, like what Vanya was talking about, just like the, 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 the structure of English, like the verb tenses and that stuff. Uh, number one, it's not a good way to teach real speaking. It doesn't work, you know. And number two, it's so boring. It's boring for you, I know. It's also boring for me to teach that textbook stuff. Ugh. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't. Uh, 
Okay, uh, here's from Brazil. Even, uh, Ivan Ivanildo, Ivanildo. <laughs> Try to pronounce your name. Okay, it is uh, so sad to see the English learning situation in my country, Brazil. There are lots of English courses. Most people try them, and after a few months, half have left. Those who get to the end of the course realize they cannot speak English. Yeah, I know. This, it's even worse. They cannot understand native speakers. AJ, please help us. How can I open their eyes? Well, that's why I'm doing this show, and you know that's why my podcasts are free. I've got my free audio book. My book is pretty cheap, uh, and even my courses are pretty cheap, actually. Um, what can you do? You know, actually, one of, one of the great things, I talked about this in a recent audio show. The first thing you can always do is to be successful yourself because you show people. That's the first kind of leadership, really, right? So you succeed with English and you continue improving your English. And obviously, you, that was a nice comment, well written. So obviously, you're already doing well with English. Um, but you, but you kind of become a good example, right? A lot of people, there's so many bad examples where people see that, oh, everybody's failing, everybody's failing, but you succeed. And then some people, not, not all of course, but some people will become curious. How, how do you do it? How, how are you succeeding? And then you share the ideas of effortless English. You can tell them about effortless English. You can tell them, you know, anything that you have done that is successful, that works that's better than these bad methods. In this way, you become a leader. You know, can you reach everybody? No, nobody. We, we never can reach everybody, but you can make a difference that way. Kind of like John Taylor Gatto with that one girl, right? So even your individual effort to improve English, it will affect other people. Other people will see you improving, 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 and they'll become curious. And that's how you can start to affect them. And then, you know, give them a link to my website if you want or just or my uh, podcast. If if that's too high a level, then maybe you can uh, connect them to some easier materials. And but more importantly, just tell them these ideas, encourage them to become independent learners. Asma says, not all teachers are bad. True. I'm lucky to have a good teacher in math that helped me get uh, full marks in the subject before. Now I have you and listen to you and I will speak fluently. Yeah, it's not the teachers. that It's not teaching that's bad. We Teachers are very useful. Right? You, you Of course, teachers are very useful. It's uh, if you want to learn English, then it's, it's helpful to have a teacher, especially in those intermediate levels who is already a fluent teacher, especially having a native speaker is very helpful. If you want to learn, I don't know, if you want to learn how to play guitar, it's certainly helpful to have somebody teach you the, you know, the basics of guitar. It's not teaching that's bad. Teaching is, teaching is thousands and thousands of years old. We have teaching forever, Right? I mean, as long as humans. It's not teaching that's the problem. It's the schools that are the problem. It's the schools, this, this bureaucracy, this organization of control. That's the problem, that they have taken teaching and they've created, they've made teaching into something that's so unnatural and dis that destroys curiosity and that's so horrible. Natural teaching is much more direct, and, and like, like I was just saying, actually, the natural way of teaching is that, number one, your first teachers always, always, always are your parents or your family. Those are your most important teachers always, not some stranger. But then secondly, as you get older, especially as you get older and especially as an adult, but even as a teenager, you become the master and you choose your teachers. You look for your teachers and you decide, ah, this is the teacher for me. Right? So you still have a teacher. It's great, but you're the boss. The difference, what happens in a school? In a school, they say, you go here. This is your teacher. You have no choice. That's your teacher. You must be in this class. What if you don't like the teacher? Doesn't matter. What if this teacher is not good for you? What if the teacher's not good in general, a bad teacher, a bad person? Doesn't matter. You have no choice. That's the problem.
That's the big problem, right? If, if, if this was a natural situation, if you're independent, you could go, you go to a class, you, like a math class, asthma. Maybe you got lucky. You got a good teacher. Good. But what if you go, and you're in school and you, they put you in a class and the teacher's terrible? In the school systems, what can you do, especially the, for kids? They can't do anything. They're stuck with a bad teacher. That's terrible. That's the problem. Now, as an independent learner, if you go, you try a teacher and you don't like them, you just fire them. Okay, I'm done. You quit their class. You quit their course and you don't use it again and you go find a different teacher. You keep looking. I mean, that's what I know. That's what you did with English. I know you've had many, many English teachers and you've been searching, searching, searching. And hopefully you found me and you like me and that's great. Fantastic. That's what Ozma just said. So it's the choice. It's that you become the boss of your learning. You you as an individual and for children, that also means families, really, because, of course, young children, it's can't make these decisions alone they're too young so the parents need to be the ones doing it or or if the parents are too busy then the parents should be deciding they should choose the teachers and not be forced into a certain class that's the problem i don't like it's the force it's the force teachers aren't bad necessarily some are bad some are good but forcing people into a class and you have no choice, you must learn from this teacher, that I don't like. That's the, one of the many big problems with schools. We've got to give the power back to the families. The power should be with you, the learner. The power should be with you, the parents. Uh, hello from Myanmar. Hello, hello. Uh, I don't have a question, but thank you so much, says Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, AJ, how did you become a teacher? Why, by the way? Oh, I've got a podcast about this, an old one, one of my first ones. I'll have to, t I'll tell a story about my early teaching days. <laughs> it's in my book, actually. I have, I have some stories about this in my book, about how to become a teacher. Uh, it's too long for me to tell now, but maybe a future podcast, I'll tell the story again. But I have some stories quite similar to John Taylor Gatto. <laughs> some kind of crazy stories from teaching in my first few years of teaching. Uh, I got, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, Hasina with another great follow-up comment. Hasina says, even if teachers try to use another method, the school won't let them. Yes, this is exactly right. This is the one of the big problems why schools are so bad. I mean, this is my story, part of my story. I tried to use different methods, but then my bosses, the principals, the school owners, didn't like me trying different methods. They, you know, so I had, I often had arguments with my bosses and uh, lots of problems at my jobs, trying to do new things and different things. So that's exactly right. That's why a lot of good teachers leave. I would say most good teachers eventually leave. A few stay, but a lot of them leave because of this. They, the teachers are not free also. The schools don't let them try new methods because they're afraid of the truth. So if you want, to be an, ind if you want an independent education and you want to reach your goals, don't always wait for someone else to tell you. You have to do it yourself. Amen, Hasina. You have to do it yourself. I, this week, uh, John Taylor Gatto, our writer of this book, he had a great tweet on Twitter. I retweeted it. He said, education's not something you receive. If you want, an edu if you want a good education, you must take it. Right? You don't wait for someone to give it to you. You have to take it. It's a different mindset. He's exactly right. right? In, in the school system, the students are passive. They sit and they wait. They receive the education. right? They receive an education. They get the education from the teachers. Okay, They just sit passively. Okay, tell us what to do. Tell us what to study. They're getting, they are receiving an education. But the mindset of an independent learner is the opposite. 
as an independent learner, you don't wait to receive. You go get your education. You take it. You find the teachers that you want. If you can't find a teacher, you find books and you read the books yourself or you find the videos or you find the audios. You're the boss. You take that education. You go get that education. You make your own education because you're the boss. You don't wait. You want to learn something, you go learn it. If you want to learn guitar, you figure out how to learn guitar. There are many ways to do it. You don't wait, oh, I hope somebody will teach me guitar. Oh, I'll just wait and wait until a guitar teacher finds me. No, you go get it. You find videos on YouTube, you find books, you, whatever. You go find, maybe you try lots of different guitar teachers in your town. There are many, 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 many methods of teaching guitar or music. You try several of them, DVDs, audios, and then you figure out the method that works for you and you learn guitar independently. By the way, you know, if you notice, if you look at a lot of very famous musicians, most of them were independent learners. Uh, one quick, ex an easy example, the Beatles. All the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, uh, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, they all learned independently. They learned to play music independently. They did not go to a music school, right? So John Lennon learned guitar. He just got a guitar and he started learning. A more famous example for guitar would be maybe Jimmy Page, a really famous guitarist. Same thing. He got a guitar when he was young and he, he just started figuring it out. I, maybe he found some books. He found other guitarists. He said, teach me a chord. He learned the chords from other guitarists and he practiced and practiced. He didn't go get a degree. He didn't go to a, a university and study guitar. He took it. He wanted to learn it and he figured out how to do it. He was aggressive and motivated and curious and an independent learner and he became a great guitarist when you look at the history of most famous musicians uh that's what most of them did there are some exceptions but the majority taught themselves they were independent learners Ah, oh, Ivanilda is uh, back with a follow comment. I'm getting my degree as a teacher this year. I'm thinking of a way to tell the school principal that I will not follow the rules, the terrible hidden curriculum. I want to be different. I want to really teach, get the kids excited about learning. Great. I recommend um, uh, Ivan, I mean, I'm trying to pronounce your name again, Ivanildo. Ivanildo. It's kind of Spanish, not Brazilian pronunciation. I'm sorry. Um, get the book, you know, TPR Storytelling. TPR Storytelling by Blaine Ray. I'm guessing you're going to teach English. If, if you're teaching language or English, please get that book, TPR Storytelling by Blaine Ray. There's two reasons I'm recommending this book. Number one, it's a great teaching method for language. First reason. The second reason is Blaine Ray uh, taught in the school system. So in that book, he gives you some ideas how to use the method in a normal school. And that's hard. It's hard to use new methods in schools. Like, for me, it was very tough because I'm a little bit of a rebel and I kind of fight against rules a lot of times. So um, <laughs> I usually just break the rules. I don't ask. I just do it. But I, got, I would get in trouble for doing that. Blaine is a more... What's the word? He's not, a, he's not as much of a rebel. He's, more, he's better at working in the system. So he has a few tips in there about how do you, if you have to give grades, if you have to do tests, if you have to follow some rules, how do you do it and still use the method? So anyway, TPR Storytelling by Blaine Ray might be helpful to you. And I wish you good luck. And just remember too, you know, if you, you get a job, you get in a school system, if you change your mind, you don't like the school system, start your own school. You could start your own school. Get some experience in a school system. That's good. Why not? And then later, maybe if you choose, it's your choice, of course, maybe if you're not happy in the school, you don't have to quit teaching. Just you might become more of an entrepreneur and start your own school or your own program or tutoring. Lots of ways to do it independently where you could still help a lot of children.
Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is another. Um. Where? How can I put this up here? Um. Hmm. Mian has a good uh, comment. I can't get it on the screen right now, but. Uh, I would like to share with you that the education in Vietnam is not easy to understand. Students go to extra classes to improve their skill. This happens in Japan too and Korea. After they go to school, they have to go to more classes. <laughs> yeah. Most of their time is spent together because all the things they because of all these things, right? So this is very common in Japan too. And I, I, probably all through Asia, I'm guessing, I, where first the kids go to normal school, six hours, but because the normal schools do a bad job, they don't do their job. The kids don't learn everything they need at the school. So then what they do? Well, then the parents send them to all these private classes after school. So what's the result? The result is these poor children, they're in a classroom, eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours a day. It's, it's crazy. It's so crazy. I mean, these poor guys, they look so tired. It happens in Japan. It's mostly, it happens about the middle school age, so middle school and high school age. It's, uh, to me, what it shows me is that the schools are terrible. If the schools did a good job, they would not need the extra classes. Why do you need extra classes? You already have six hours a day or more. So why do the kids also need more classes after school? Well, it's because the classes in school are not working. So then they have to do even more outside of school. It's ridiculous. The stuff is not that difficult. The kids should be able to learn it. If they were doing a good job in school, that would be plenty of time. But this is the problem. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, another com comment about English. Monica says, all the school systems are grammar oriented, not on communication. Yes, teachers at public schools have to concentrate on tests and grammar. Correct. Then after years, students don't know how to use the language. Thank God I have my own school and teach myself using your methods. Thank you, AJ. Fantastic, Monica, on both of those. Number one, that you teaching yourself and you know, having your own school, great, 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 great. We become independent learners. Independent learners is what Monica's talking about. So much more effective. And what's great is as adults then, you know, like even all, even Nildo was saying that you know, he wants to help children. Well, first we help ourselves become independent learners as adults. And then what do we do? Then we can start to independently coach and teach children. We can, of course, our own children, but we can also do little, um, you know, independent programs online, offline, whatever, uh, just to help more and more kids and to tell other parents about these ideas. And we can start to grow, grow, grow this great independent learning. Ah, Carol with a great comment. Hey, Carol. I'm a teacher and I teach only adults. Yeah. My first goal now is to show my students that learning is a lifetime process. Yes, yes, yes. And I try to bring back to them the curiosity they've lost at school. Good comments, Carol. This is exactly what I do. Of course, I teach adults too. And you, you, you're exactly right. Those. It's interesting because... Children and adults, it's different problems usually as a teacher. And the problem with adults usually is that they are bored. They've lost their curiosity. Sometimes they've lost their motivation. And they have so many kind of negative feelings because of school that they're just kind of bored about learning. Or they have, or sometimes adults have an idea that you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm too old for this now. I'm 40. It's too, I'm too old to learn English. I'm, I'm 40. I'm too old to learn the guitar. I'm 40. I'm too old to do whatever, or 50, or 60. It doesn't matter the number. And this, this, so you're right about that. With, when you're teaching adults, 
this is the big challenge is to help them find that curiosity. It's still in there usually. It's usually still in there, but it's kind of back behind the boredom, behind these bad beliefs, these negative beliefs. Oh, I'm too old or uh, right. And but you can do it. You can find it. You can help them kind of wake up again and find that natural curiosity and that natural motivation. And it's fantastic when they finally do find that. Then they realize, oh yeah, learning is all the time. Learning is for all humans, all humans, everybody alive. You can continue to learn. That's what's great. So it's, it's all ages, you know, two-year-olds and 90-year-olds. Okay, I think it's about time for me to go. Okay, I think that's all for me for now. Time for me to go. I'm going to... Uh, getting hot in here in this room for some reason <laughs> so there, no air con <laughs> my wife's laughing so anyway i'm gonna go get a cool drink and cool down wonderful talking to you as always now remember i do audio shows every day every day every day i do this show i do the video show live like this and you know this is just because it's fun to do live once a week but the main shows are audio shows that I do every single day. Be sure to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to that free audio podcast. How do you do it? Any podcast app. There are many podcasting apps. Anyone. Just get it. Search for Effortless English Podcast and subscribe. You can also, there's, I have a web page with some links to podcast apps. It's uh, EffortlessEnglishClub.com, like on the screen here, EffortlessEnglishClub.com, slash, the forward line, slash, podcasts, with an S at the end, podcasts. EffortlessEnglishClub.com, slash, podcasts, will give you links to different podcasting apps. So please join me every day for my audio show. And as always, join my VIP program. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Dot com. Lots of love. See you next time.